seems like we're ready to get going. So today we have Professor Aaron Romanowski, who's visiting us from uh, San Jose State, so not too far away, another Cal State, one of our Cal State buddies. So uh, Professor Romanowski is also a California native, like I know many of our students are. Uh, he did his bachelor's down in UC Santa Barbara as a part of the CCS, actually, right? The oh, yeah. College of Creative Studies, which is a really great program there. He then moved across the country to do his PhD at Harvard, um, and then got to do what, you know, a lot of people love one aspect of science, which is that you get to travel a lot. And he did postdocs all over the place. It seemed like you were traveling all over from, um, where were you first? In the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, and then in the UK, and then you went to Chile. Chile. Yeah. Um, so all over the place. So one reason to do science is it comes with getting to travel. Um, and so now he, he came back home to, to California, Northern California, and is teaching at San Jose State, as I said. So Aaron and I, another great thing that he, he does, so we first met because we're both uh, steering committee members for the CalBridge program. So for those of you who are physics majors, this is a program that you should keep your eye out for, especially if you're approaching maybe your junior year. This is a program to help um, physics students at Cal States get into physics and astronomy PhD programs. So Aaron's actually leading up the efforts here in the north, so um, we're really grateful to him. So you could ask him or me if you have any questions about that program. So with that, take it away. Thank you. So, does anybody recognize, I'm sure somebody recognizes this location. Is it a physicist's favorite spot in Sonoma County? Well, it looks like Gravity Hill. Gravity Hill. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so you can go out there and do your experiment with, with ramps and balls and things like that and see how Newton's laws are violated. If you haven't, haven't been out there yet, that's so why I kind of whiz by there on the way here. Because um, I grew up around here, so I remember that from when I was a kid, but I hadn't seen it in 30-something years. So, but now, nowadays, you just get on, obviously, the internet and it'll tell you where to find it. So it's just a spot where you can park your car at the bottom of the hill, and but then it, put it in neutral and it rolls up the hill <laughs> against gravity, apparently. So it's sort of like in Santa Cruz, we have a mystery spot. It's called, you might have heard of it. It sounds like Sonoma State, you have your own mystery spot. This is just a couple miles away from here. Um, so I thought that would be a nice way to frame what we're going to talk about is mysterious galaxies. We call it the uh, extreme galaxies, very mysterious, what they are, where they came from. and. Uh, Feel free to ask a couple questions here and there if uh, something is too confusing. But remember, this is supposed to be confusing. It's cutting edge science. Um, this will be different from what you hear in most science classes where you've got your textbook, things that are hundreds of years old or decades old science. This is stuff that is hot off the press uh, and that we don't quite understand fully. So that's what's fun about it. And like a lot of science these days, this doesn't happen as a solo effort. Gone are the days of sitting in the ivory tower and working through equations. Most science these days is done in teams, and international teams, uh, a lot of them. These are a lot of people around the world who are on, I'm involved with teams that make all this science possible. And uh, I'm one part of the, the team. Everyone has their role to play. And um, let me just start off with this. I'm sure somebody knows what we're looking at. Anybody? What? Anybody recognize that? Andromeda. Andromeda. Andromeda Galaxy, yes. Also called M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, Messier 31. This is our, our sister galaxy, sort of a, a twin of the Milky Way almost, um, or at least the same, similar size and mass to the Milky Way. And uh, something else that you might, so this is a very famous object. It's the most distant object you can see in the night sky with the naked eye, or the day sky for that matter. But. Um, uh, and this will, this will, this used to appear on the background for the Mac operating, one of the Mac operating systems, except that they decided to Photoshop some parts out that were not aesthetically appealing. I think it might have been this one. So up here is something else that you might not have ever noticed. It's called a dwarf elliptical galaxy. It turns out that's the most numerous type of galaxy in the universe. Not as spectacular as these big spiral galaxies. And does anybody know what that is? Do you see this here? Anybody a real? Anybody's an amateur astronomer likes to do their Messier objects? No. That's M32, right after M31. And it's called a compact elliptical. For a long time, it was the only one of its kind known. And that dates back to the 18th century when Charles Messier would have found that. <clears throat> so those, um, oh, and I should also note up there, this is not actually next to Andromeda Galaxy, but it's called the Fornax Dwarf Sroidal. It's a satellite 
dwarf galaxy of the Milky Way. So it's another example of a type of a dwarf. So giant galaxy, dwarf, dwarf, dwarf. Um, that's a dwarf elliptical, compact elliptical, and dwarf spheroidal. So they all look a little bit different. And they all have sizes of what we call a kiloparsec. A kiloparsec is, is 3,000 light years. So that's the size uh, of these galaxies on scales of, of a kiloparsec. Now, if you zoom in, most of, most of these dots you see are foreground stars in the Milky Way, but a few of these dots, actually, when you, when you zoom in on them, are decomposed into millions of stars or hundreds of thousands of stars. And these are called globular clusters. Each giant galaxy has a whole array of these. Our Milky Way has about 150. Andromeda Galaxy has about over 300. And um, these are really fascinating objects in themselves. And they're, they're on scales of about a parsec, so a few light years in size. So here you've got galaxies made up out of stars, and they've got these small star clusters, compact star clusters in them, globular clusters being the most spectacular versions. OK, so that's just to kind of set the stage for the normal things that we know about, we've known about for 100 years, most of this. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the new stuff in a minute. But <clears throat> I'm not just going to show pretty pictures, which you can you know, turn on the TV and watch uh, some nice program to see pictures of galaxies and stuff. But we want to do some physics here. So one of the first things we want to do is measure mass. So this is a, a, an example of a diagram we use to measure the mass of an astronomical object. And it comes through using forces or accelerations. Can anybody name a force in this diagram? It's an object orbiting in a circle. Centrifugal. Centrifugal. And how would you write that down? What's the, what's the formula for that? Formula for centrifugal force. It's a fictitious force, but it does have its own formula. Anybody know formula? Okay. Someone's had the first year physics class problem. Yes? MV over R squared? And very good. Uh, MV over R squared. Almost. Very close. <laughs> the two, that squared goes somewhere else. Anybody remember? MV squared. MV squared over R. Yeah. OK, and if you're not sure, you could work out the units, but we won't you know, have time for that now. OK, so that is the, the, the centrifugal force is the force that's required to keep it in orbit. It could be the swinging a ball over your head on, on a rope, which I didn't bring one of those today. But this is, what's, what force is actually holding this thing in, in orbit? What, uh, so the centrifugal, centripetal is a sort of generic forces. It could be a ball on a string. But what's holding a planet into orbit around the sun? Gravity. And what's the formula for gravity? Big G M1, M2 over uh, R squared. Yeah, so I'll do big M, little m over R squared, OK? So the gravitational force, this is Newton's gravity, is equal to this centrifugal or centripetal force. And then you can kind of work this out. You can cross out the m's, do some algebra, cross out one of those r's. And now you've got the big M, the mass of that central object is equal to, sorry, v squared r over g. So if you want to measure the mass of the object at the center, and I don't have it labeled, but that's the big M, what things do you need to measure? The velocity and the radius. So all, and, and the g gravitational constant, you assume that we Google that and know what that is. right? That's how Newton did it. Um, <coughs> So that's pretty simple. We want to know the measure mass of anything in the universe. All we have to do is measure the radius and the velocity. Wow, that's so easy. OK, well, it turns out those are the really hard things to measure often. But, but you can measure a lot of different things. So one of the mass, oops, I should have I gave the answer. But OK, how do you measure velocity? One of the big ways to measure it is through this thing called Doppler shift. And you might, you're familiar with Doppler shift with a, a car going down the road or a police car siren. And it's like, OK, it's a different. The sound changes pitch as it goes by. That's a Doppler shift in sound. Well, it turns out light does the same thing. It's just that a uh, police car doesn't go fast enough for you to see that. OK. Um, but if you can, you can measure at higher speeds, or you can measure in the lab with, with high precision, you can, these are spectral lines at specific wavelengths of, of light. Um, like from a neon light, for example, you can measure these, uh, these arc lines. And then you can see how they shift in wavelength. And I've kind of positioned this over in wavelength space going to the right you might be able to see that the blue becomes slightly greenier, the green becomes slightly yellow, and the red becomes even redder. That's this red shift of the light. And that happens when it goes away from you. Um, if it goes towards you, it becomes blue shifted. OK, so there's the formula which I did. 
So you can use, that's the, the most commonly used method to measure velocity of an astronomical object, measuring that, that Doppler shift or the red shift and blue shift. So you can do that to measure the planet around, around a star, like the sun or uh, the Earth around the sun. You can measure a star going around a black hole. Uh, stars at the center of our, our galaxy, you can, you can see the, or, the orbits of them going around that supermassive black hole at the center. Gas within a galaxy. Um, galaxies within a cluster of galaxy. Uh, <clears throat> although it's not always so simple. If you've got a nice circular orbit like this, that's the simplest picture we, we, we can talk about. But you can also get an elliptical orbit, or you can get a bunch of collection of stars which are all on random orbits. When you measure that, you're not measuring what we call a circular velocity. You measure a velocity dispersion. People who've had stat statistical mechanics use something that you might have talked about in terms of the velocities of air molecules in the room. They've got a velocity dispersion, a, a root mean square velocity. So you can measure the root mean square velocity of stars in a galaxy and again connect that to the, to the gravitational forces in the galaxy. And that's what we call the virial theorem, which I don't have time to, to work through right now, but that's the standard technique. So let's go to a simple case of a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way where stars and gas are, are orbiting on fairly circular orbits. Again, there's that formula again uh, of the GM over R. Now I've kind of turned it around and said the velocity squared. So what you can do, this is a, a radio image of gas in this, in this galaxy. That's kind of just a diagram at the top. And here's the gas. And you can see the red shift, the red shift and the blue shift. You can see the, the orbital velocity of that gas. And then you can convert that into a mass and one of the fascinating things is that um, you would expect, you see how it's GM over R, as you get to the, beyond, out the outskirts of a galaxy, the mass is basically constant. You've got a mass of the galaxy and the velocity should go down. Just like in the solar system, the outer planets go slower. The farther out you go, the planets are going slower because the gravity is weaker out there, so it's slower and slower. And you expect this, what we call a Keplerian uh, rotation curve, where the, the velocities go down as one over the square root of R. Now, Various people a few decades ago, including Vera Rubin, one of the most uh, famous ones, went out and measured these velocities in external galaxies, and they found that things were not behaving as they expected. So this is the, the velocity as you go out in radius or distance from the galaxy, and it's really these little black points here are the observations. You see it kind of goes up, and then it stays flat, and it's constant as you go out. Rather than this curve shows you what you expect here, that, that should drop off. So what it tells us is there's some extra component here that kicks in and keeps the whole thing flat. There's this extra what we call a halo component. Okay, some mysterious gravitational halo that's keeping the, the stars going quickly in the outer parts. So the observations of the circular velocity is being constant. And if you integrate the, the uh, gravitational potential here, you find out that the mass gets much bigger as you go to the outer parts, linear with radius. Huge amount of mass. More mass in this, this, this substance that you can't see than the mass that than you can see in the stars and gas. And we call that, that dark matter. Now dark matter um, is, I'll come to that in a minute, what that is. But here's kind of an artistic view of what that might look like. If you could see the dark matter, which you can't, you would see this kind of halo. And we call a halo, it's not this two-dimensional ring or something. It's really a sphere, a filled sphere, like a glob of stuff which is uh, encompassing the galaxy. And the galaxy is kind of embedded in, the, in that halo. So all galaxies have these kind of halos, we think. And in between the galaxies, there's all dark matter pervading the universe, so this, this substance that, that pervades the universe. So this is a little picture of the Hubble Space Telescope peering through galaxies, which are all embedded in this, this uh, morass of dark matter filling the universe, the filamentary structure. <clears throat> so well, dark matter, well, what does that mean? Well, dark matter is a very generic term for anything that you can't see electromagnetically through light, uh, including radio. And um, when I was in graduate school, we, didn't ha we had no idea what dark matter was. There's a lot of possibilities. It could be dark planets, uh, uh, low-mass stars, uh, cold gas, black holes, neutrinos, all sorts of things. And over the years, a lot of these have been gradually ruled out. And I say all, all these ones up there, they're called pretty ordinary. Some of the first things you would think of, like where maybe we're miss, there's black holes or planets or stars that we're missing. And those are, uh, I didn't put it up here, those are called ma machos for massive compact halo objects. And the machos are ruled out now. 
So although there's still some possibility of primordial black holes, that's kind of had a little renaissance about what that could be. So what does that leave? It leaves some kind of elementary particle. Okay, we're um, what we call non-baryonic particles. It's not part of our standard uh, things that we interact with on a daily basis. Um, if you can think of an analogous particle, it would be the neutrino, which was not detected until fairly recently. Some particle that very weakly interacts. You have to have giant mines full of water and, and look at these things for a long time with uh, certain detectors to get occasional flashes of neutrinos. So the particles are there. They're flooding through this room right now, spewing out from the sun. Extremely difficult to detect. And it could be the same thing with the dark matter. It's just, it's all around us, but you can't detect it. So some of these, um, there was something called the, uh, uh, the Wimp Miracle, which is there was, a, there was a, a model for where these elementary particles might come from, which has kind of gone down the tubes in recent years. The uh, idea that this is a supersymmetric particle called a neutralino, for example, that's been gradually ruled out. There's something called the uh, ultralight axions or uh, scalar uh, particle. We call this fuzzy dark matter. I'll come back to this later. Um, sterile neutrinos, um, and there's a lot of detection experiments underway to try to find these. Uh, this is one that's in, um, I think it's in Montana or someplace uh, out in that region called the Lux experiment. These deep mines with a, with a chamber which will detect flashes of, of radiation when a dark matter particle, what's that? I think it's South Dakota. South Dakota, sorry. Um, and I won't go into the details, but this is sort of the mass, this is a parameter space of mass of the particle we're looking for, and this is the cross section, how strongly it interacts. And over the years, there's many, many, you see all these lines or curves, are all ver different experiments all over the world that have tried to find dark matter particles. And they've pushed the limits down to detection way, way down until we still haven't found something confirmed. So that's kind of a, left the field in a bit of a, a grumpy state where um, now we're not really sure what to look for. And looking for a lot of different things that are maybe not the main particles we originally looked for. Okay, so that's to set the stage of what we think dark matter is. It's this exotic elementary particle. And it turns out to be, I mean, it was a surprise when it was first discovered and controversial like a lot of things. It turns out to be fundamental to the way we think the universe works. So I'm gonna play a little video here. This is a simulation of the birth of a galaxy <clears throat> like the Milky Way starting shortly after the Big Bang. And these are stars that are marked and you have these clumps of stars that fall in from sort of the, the voids in between galaxies. And they build up this larger galaxy. And you see they, they gradually are eaten. And they form these plumes and shells and streams and kind of dissolve into the main galaxy over time. You have the swarm of smaller galaxies. You see there's a lot more of the smaller galaxies than the bigger galaxies. This is called the hierarchical picture of galaxy formation. You've got a lot more smaller things than big things. And the big things grow by eating the smaller things. So, and then you get what's going to be like a major merger that happens here. Okay, let me just, this is a long video, so I won't show the whole thing. Oh, there's the major merger. Big splash as two galaxies collide together. And there we go. Okay, and then gravitational dynamical friction from the, the dark matter slows things down and makes it merge. So I'm going to stop that. Whoops. Okay. Um, so one of the key things here is that this stuff doesn't happen by itself. These, the, the galaxies wouldn't form. There isn't enough mass in the stars and gas to bring all these galaxies together and form stars and planets and form us eventually. You actually need the extra gravity from the dark matter, which I, I didn't mention, that's 85% of the matter, to bring these galaxies together. So it turns out that, that dark matter is what's created structure in the universe, which is basically everything interesting that we know of. Um, so that's really fundamental, um, but was not recognized until the 70s or 80s. Okay, so now returning to what we can see, I'm going to do a map. This is a plot that, uh, until recently, you, no one would make this kind of a plot. But it's a plot, like I, sh I showed in the beginning, of the size of a galaxy, or an object, in terms of parsecs. So up here, a thousand parsecs, over a thousand parsecs are galaxies. And this is the luminosity, or absolute magnitude of a galaxy. This is the log luminosity up here. So this is a log-log scale. It's a way to show incredible dynamic range of really large, massive, gal or luminous galaxies and really compact, uh, low luminosity objects. And so there's galaxies up here from the giants down to the dwarfs, and then these globular clusters down here. And they're pretty just showing, it's pretty clear that like, there's a cluster and there's a galaxy, they're very different. Like I said, nobody would make this plot because it's mixing apples and oranges. But the reason I'm gonna show that 
is because it turns out there is more to the picture than that. Um, and there are some hints of this already going back decades of some of the, the most luminous globular clusters and some of them getting to be fairly large that seemed like oddballs. Um, a famous one's called Omega Centauri, and there's some other ones. If you go to the southern hemisphere, they tend to be easier to see, but there's some northern hemisphere objects as well, kind of like this. So they didn't quite fit in. They don't, they're a little bit different from the, the normal globular clusters. So some clues that something else was going on. So where this, this first part of my talk kicks off about these uh, exotic galaxies is a discovery. Well, first of all, let me ask, how many galaxies do you see in this picture? Anybody? Two? Four? All right, there's the two obvious ones. Where's the other two that somebody sees four? I saw them pretty sure off the right. This thing? Yep. Yep. Good. And there's another one like that. So those are, are similar to this one, like a giant spiral galaxy, but they're in the background, so they look smaller. Okay. And those are things that the Hubble Space Telescope tries to look at more and more distant galaxies in earlier in time, the way that the light travel time works. But it turns out there's another one right there. Okay. Really bright and compact. It looks like a foreground star. And most of the other things, that's a foreground star. And probably these other things are too. Okay, if you're looking for galaxies, you wouldn't look at those. Um, and, it turned, and that was confirmed through a couple of different methods, including this is a Hubble Space Telescope image. You can get enough detail to tell that's not a star. It's a, gal a compact galaxy. It turns out it's bright enough that if you go back 100 years, uh, Hubble had a picture of this but missed it, you know, the old photographic plate. And it's not Hubble's fault. I mean, it's like, how would he know till, till that's not a star like the other ones? He didn't have the Hubble Space Telescope uh, in his name at that point. So this is what we call an ultra-compact dwarf, or the densest galaxy known at the time. So it's taking uh, a lot of stars, around 40 million stars, and compacting it down into a, a radius of 25 parsecs. <clears throat> and so for scale, here's this Omega Sin, this largest club or the cluster in the Milky Way, most luminous. And there's what this, this ultra-compact dwarf looks like. So it's sort of like this larger version of it. Okay, um, and uh, this, was, this was discovered about 20 years ago. Some of these started being discovered sort of by accident, really by accident, and raising questions about, well, really, are these the most compact galaxies or are they the largest, largest star clusters? Well, when this was discovered, this one in 2013, it's so bright and so obvious that I thought, well, that should be an easy project for students to go looking for that. So a couple of my students at San Jose State were interested in doing some astronomy research. I said, well, let's go out and look for one of these things. If, if this one was found by, by accident and it's pretty bright and easy to see once you know where to look, now we know what to look for. Let's go look, look for more. And, um, and they did. And Richard, when found right away almost, he found another one. This is a, called a color magnitude diagram. This is a color and this is a, basically the luminosity. The original object was here. He found one here that was even more luminous. So more, more compact. So that's a picture of his object from what we call the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So this is um, this fantastic database for those who haven't heard of it. Everyone's probably heard of the Hubble Space Telescope. But for, for astronomers, the, the, which has been super impactful, but the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is basically as impactful. It's not like spectacular in terms of space-based you know, space images, but it's a digital image of the entire sky done very homogeneously in access to the whole world where you can get out your phone and find a galaxy like this if you know what to look for through a web page. So, and then we did all sorts of follow-up. This is a spectrum to get, okay, when you get a spectrum, you remember, anybody remember what you're looking for with a spectrum? Why would you take a spectrum? Uh, what colors are being absorbed and emitted? Colors absorbed and emitted with through those lines, and you measure the lines to measure? Doppler, Doppler shift. So the velocity, so you get the velocity of this, this object. You also get the composition of the object. This tells you about the different elements in, in the object. Okay, so um, we also went and did some Hubble Space Telescope imaging. So that's an image of Richard's object, so it's kind of fun as an undergrad to go find something in the Hubble Space Telescope, take a picture of it for you. That's not something that happens every day. But, um, and this is what Michael, I didn't mention too much about what Michael did. Michael found another one. This was an archival Hubble image, and he found this thing that is even smaller. So this is uh, two, 200 million solar masses. This is about uh, 10 million solar masses, but compacted down to a region of two parsecs. So super, super compact. We tried to coin this new term called the hypercompact cluster, the most, the densest object star cluster ever found, the first of its kind. So if you can imagine, here's the night sky seen from 
maybe the hills here if it's dark enough at night, and you see a few thousand stars with the naked eye. If you lived on a planet in one of these compact star clusters, it would look something like this. You'd see a million stars visible to the naked eye. Um, so maybe a lot of people would be astronomers in that, on that planet. If they live, because there's probably a lot of uh, high energy star, stellar remnants that are formed in these dense stellar things that shoot out radiation everywhere, probably kills everything, but that's another story. Okay, so going back to that original diagram, here is the, the luminosity, log luminosity, log radius, and it, before there was these two separate sequences. Now if we plot in things discovered the, over the past two decades, it fills in the gaps. There's a lot more stuff all over the diagram. It's, sort of, it's all filling in the parameter space, including there's this bridge here between the star clusters and the galaxies. So now we start asking the question, where do the galaxies stop and the star clusters begin? OK. So we have other things which I don't have time to talk about. Ultra faint dwarfs over here, extended star clusters here. Um, ultra compact dwarfs, compact ellipticals up here, UCDs are ultra compact dwarfs. These are the compact ellipticals like the M32 I showed at the beginning. So now we've asked our asking the question. Now we're starting to discover these things. We can measure their properties, but we want to know how they formed, how are they related. So here's a question now, you know, science question. I'm going to show three pictures of three objects. This is a giant galaxy, elliptical galaxy called M87. I put them all on the zoom so they look the same. This is a globular star cluster. And then you've got this ultra compact dwarf that kind of looks morphologically similar, but which one is it? Like how, how would you, do you assign it to be a galaxy or a star cluster? Like can anybody think about properties or some way you would tell the difference? Like how would you know if something's a galaxy or a star cluster? Does it have a black hole? Yeah. And some, someone back there? It looks uh, elliptical. Does it look elliptical or not? That might tell you something. Anything else it's different between star clusters and galaxies? Yeah. Luminosity versus size. Luminosity versus size? Yeah. OK. Um, let me just give you a clue that when I say this is a galaxy, we think most likely that didn't always look like that. It actually used to be a bigger galaxy and it got stripped down to a smaller one. This is the nucleus of a bigger galaxy. So that might help us think a little bit more about some of the differences. Um, okay, well, let me give you some other hints. What about dark matter? Remember I mentioned in the beginning all galaxies seem to have dark matter. So if these have dark matter or are used to, that might be a clue. Um, black holes, we heard. Uh, types of stars in these, because the, the star clusters tend to have very, they have very uniform stellar populations. The galaxies are, uh, they all form in one burst, while the galaxies form over time more and more stars. So that'll tell you something. And then the orbits of these, these objects around their host galaxies could tell us. Or anything else that you think of. So, you know, if you come up with a brainstorm after hours, let me know, shoot me an email. Maybe you'll have an idea that we haven't thought of. So let's go with the supermassive black hole <coughs> notion. Okay, so all giant galaxies, as far as we know, now have a supermassive black hole in the center, including the Milky Way. The Milky Way is actually a small supermassive black hole. Um, so the definition of that is between about a million and a billion solar masses, give or take. And the Milky Way is on the low side there. So this is a famous galaxy, M87, I mentioned before, now famous for its black. It's been known a long time to have this black hole. You can see this, this thing sticking out. There's a jet shooting up from the central black hole. Okay, so black holes paradoxically are both the darkest and the most luminous objects in the universe. The reason being because stuff before it falls in can heat up through the gravitational potential difference and heat up enormously and emit all sorts of radiation, become the brightest things in the universe. Anybody know what the bright, what does a black hole look like when it's super bright emitting radiation? What do you call that? Anybody ran across that in their class yet? Hawking radiation, yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's another part of it that uh, has not been detected. So Hawking radiation we think probably happens, but that's not very bright. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good idea. Anything else? Quasar. Quasars, have you heard of quasars? Or active galactic nuclei. Quasi, quasi stellar object, They're, they look like stars, but they turn out to be halfway across the universe. They're black holes emitting radiation. Anyway, so. Um, but they're really, we call them a blazar. A blazar, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of different classes. From quasars are the most awesome ones, you know, luminous, and then there's all th sorts of things uh, in between. So, anybody know why M87 is famous in black hole world now? Something that happened recently? 
What's that? Is it the one we have the picture of? The one we have the picture of, yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I remember that this came out when we knew that there was the rumors this was coming out. We didn't know because they've been observing two things. One is M87, and one is the black hole in the center of our own galaxy called Sag A star. And we didn't know which one they, they had gotten the picture of, and it turned out it was M87. So there it is, and again, there's the silhouette of the black hole, and there's the, the bright material surrounding the black hole before it falls in, emitting light. And there's the, uh, the postdoc, I can't remember her name now, part of, again, it's a giant team. But she was really instrumental in uh, imaging this thing, doing the computer algorithm to reconstruct it. And that, that's her reaction when she first saw the image appear. You know, I guess the first person in the, on Earth to ever see that image of a black hole. So that was really fun. Um, this is an artist's conception of what that might look like, the, the uh, material orbiting that black hole and stuff shooting out in a, in a jet or a beam along the, the pole of that axis. Now, if, uh, if you could really get in close to one of these, it might look like this. You can see the black hole in front of a star field in the center of a galaxy. And you might see the distortions from gravitational lensing of the background stars. You can see. That's again, that's a, a, an art, artistic view. So, okay, this idea that these ultra compact dwarfs, if they are galaxies and they have supermassive black holes in the center, let's go find them. And we use a technique to, that kind of zooms us into the center. Now, we want to find a black hole, we want to measure its mass. So that means we want to measure what? How are we going to measure the mass of something? Anybody remember? Velocity. Velocity and radius. and radius. So we can find things down close to the center of the galaxy. We know what the radius is there. And then we want to measure the velocities. Is, is, and we need to do both of those. And this uses, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is good at this, but it's not as good as ground-based telescopes using a technology called adaptive optics, which cancel out atmospheric distortions. Don't have time to get into that. But basically, this is what came out of that. This is, a, this is actual observational data. This is a color scale velocity dispersion, basically the speed or the heat of the star stellar velocity. So it's kind of blue, they're cold, but right in the center there's this hot spot of really fast moving stars and it's confined in this really small area. So you could run through, once you measure those velocities, you could run through this calculation and get the black hole mass. And oops. And it turns out that black hole mass is about 20 million solar masses. So that's that's a supermassive black hole, and well within the range. But what's interesting about that is it's a fair fraction of the entire mass of the, the galaxy. That this is a galaxy that was about um, about uh, uh, 100 million solar masses. So this is something uh, comparable to that. Well, I, I I didn't mention in the beginning when galaxies have supermassive black holes, it's less than a percent usually. It's a tiny little thing. They're spectacular, but they're a tiny percent of the mass. This is much more massive, 50 percent of the mass. So. We consider this to be a smoking gun. We don't think that a galaxy forms this relatively massive black hole just on, by itself. We think that it used to be a bigger galaxy that formed that small black hole, relatively speaking. Then the rest of the galaxy got stripped away and left this dense little part behind. Okay, it maybe started off as 10 billion solar mass galaxy in stars. So let me show you um, a video to demonstrate this. So uh, Michael is one of the students that discovered a hypercompact cluster. And he wasn't satisfied with just doing the observations. He wanted to do a little simulation. So he did this program. Uh, has anybody learned Python here as part of the major? Yeah, great. You should all learn Python if you're a physics major. OK. Um, or want to do astronomy, because it's the lingua franca now. Anyway, he used something <laughs> called Blender, which you may or may not have heard of that. It's a video gaming uh, rendering system, which kind of makes pretty pictures. And it's got Python under the hood. So you can run a simula science grade simulation with a video game animation and create this movie of the tidal, tidal disruption of a, of a galaxy by a larger one. OK, if I can, there it goes. So there it is. It falls into the center. It gets quickly disrupted by the gravitational tides and starts diffusing. The stars diffusing in, um, in space around the galaxy, but there's this dense nucleus. A lot of galaxies have a dense nucleus at the center, and that is compact enough that it resists the gravitational tides of a larger galaxy. That's what we call the tidal radius. The Jacobi radius is, um, is, is finite, and it allows it to enclose some stars. So that's left behind. It's sort of like if you have a cherry, and you eat the cherry, there's a cherry pit left behind to show that you ate a you ate something. And so the rest of the galaxy stars kind of blend in and disappear, but you have this dense nugget that's left behind. So we zoom around. So now we're going to 
show the observation. And then imagine you could zoom into that dense star cluster in the black hole at the center. And then a planet. There we go. Okay, so that probably gives you a, more of a picture of what, what we think is going on here. And we can see object, we can see that that actually happens snapshots. This is, I didn't say this was the time scale of about 3 billion years. So all you can do is see snapshots of this happening in time. And we can see things at different, different objects at different time samples, like at different stages of disruption. We can kind of start filling in the picture. So that was that first one I showed that we measured that super, I, I wasn't involved in measuring the supermassive black hole, but some of the later ones. And there's a, a group now that we have of going out and measuring more of these. And this is an example of the velocity dispersion with radius from the galaxy. And with no black hole, it's fairly flat, and then it drops off steeply when there is a black hole, which is the observation. So we've got that now on several objects, including Richards, who found that first one as an undergrad. His object is, uh, where did it go? I think it's not, oh, it's VUCD3, it's this one here. His turns out to have a supermassive black hole as well. And uh, all, the, all four or five of the bright ones we've measured now, I think there's five now, have these supermassive black holes, so they all fit this picture of uh, being a stripped galaxy. Now the fainter ones are much harder to, down here, are much harder to measure. So far we haven't detected any black holes, so it still leaves the question open of what are these objects? Are they stripped galaxies or not? So I say the high mass UCDs, we think these are probably all stripped galaxies. The low mass ultra compact dwarfs, we still don't know. And some models using dark matter formation of the structure formation of the universe predict that they don't think these could all be stripped galaxies, but I think the jury's still out. And we're doing more statistical studies to try to, to try to tell which of these ones are and aren't. Until we can start measuring black holes or not, that would be, again, the smoking gun. So just to summarize this part of the story, the exotic galaxies, the ultra-compact dwarfs, there's these extended star clusters that are like the well-known globular clusters, except larger sizes and luminosities. And uh, the most massive ones seem to be stripped galaxy nuclei with supermassive black holes and unusual stellar populations. The lower mass UCD ultra compact dwarfs are still a mystery. It might be that somebody here goes off to graduate school and does that in their thesis and tells us the answer five, ten years from now. So that still is an open mystery about what, what are these things? Are they star clusters or are they galaxies? And we have debates about them to this day. Okay, so let me move on to the other exotic type of galaxy. It's the other end of the spectrum. Um, and we've had lots of interesting press on this. This is called the uh, fluffiest galaxies. So it looks like a giant smudge. And uh, when these were first discovered, they seemed kind of cute. They were uh, discovered by this group called, uh, using a very different type of telescope called the Dragonfly, Dragonfly Eye Array. And it's a collection of, of telephoto lenses, of commercial grade lenses in a cluster. And what's special about these is they have some kind of uh, classified or uh, industry classified nano uh, scale coating on them that, that has a very good anti-reflective surface. And that's one of the big problems of detecting very faint things is the reflections in the telescopes. So you can have the biggest telescope there is and still not see very faint low surface brightness things because of reflections and other imperfections. And this, this telescope, this little thing, it's a robotic telescope in New Mexico, is optimized to try to find these things. And they went and looked at the coma cluster of galaxies. They were looking for something else, intracluster light. And they just noticed there's a whole bunch of these little smudges there. And they're like, what are these? So they called them ultra diffuse galaxies. And uh, we've done all sorts of follow up. I wasn't originally involved with this team, but I got excited about it and got plugged in. We started doing lots of follow up, including this is with the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see all this <coughs> stuff here. These are galaxies in the background called the see through galaxies. You can see through them because there's so few stars in them. They're very, very diffuse. So if you remember that picture at the beginning with the Andromeda Galaxy, if we had one of these things in the local group, which I think is, uh, we haven't found one yet. It's still possible we might have missed one. It would look like this. So this big blob that's almost as big as the Andromeda Galaxy, but have hardly any stars. It's got about the same number of stars as this compact elliptical, this dwarf elliptical, but spread out over the size of a giant galaxy. So something very different, very weird. And so you already see there's this wide range of galaxy dwarf types. The, these, these three here and these three, they're all different types of galaxies. And we're kind of scratching our heads over how they're all formed. OK, 
So we say sizes uh, like giants and luminosities like dwarfs. And there's something else interesting about them. They turn out to have globular clusters, as just like these giant galaxies have. But they have a bunch of them. Some of them have tons of globular clusters, and the little dwarf galaxies shouldn't have them. They should have none, or they should have one or two. But these things can have 30, 40 of these globular clusters. So that's a big part of the mystery. So if we go back to the size uh, luminosity space again, there's the luminosity, and there's the size. And this is the sequence between giants and I've just I've cut off the globular clusters. I'm just focusing on the galaxies from the dwarfs to the giants. And these ultra diffuse galaxies are over here, these large sizes, low luminosities, which is equivalent to having a low surface brightness. So around 100 million uh, times the luminosity of the sun, two to four kiloparsecs in size, 25th uh, magnitudes per square arc second. So much fainter than the night sky. Okay, they were discovered, like I said, in the coma cluster originally, or noticed, and uh, you could get into lots of detail, but then they were discovered all over the place, in between galaxies and galaxy groups and clusters, sort of everywhere. It was, again, one of these things that nobody was looking for, and a lot of them you could see once you knew they were there, but just like the ultra-compact dwarfs, they didn't fit in with people's uh, picture of what you're looking for. If you, if anybody knows the gorilla experiment, if you don't know, go, go Google the video and watch it. But if, it's one of these things that if you're not looking for something, you can miss it. So if you had a, looked at the, your inside ultra diffuse galaxy, you looked at the night sky, you had just a couple of naked eye stars there. So you might not be interested in astronomy at all because there's nothing to see. So how do you make these ultra diffuse galaxies? Well, a lot of people have been working on this in the last few years since they were discovered. And one of the really obvious ways to do it is they're found in a cluster. If you can look in a, in a galaxy cluster in x-rays, um, it turns out there's so much matter there that it heats up gas that falls in to, to te high temperatures of about 100, uh, 10 million to 100 million Kelvin. And, uh, and that produces thermal x-ray radiation. So this is a big x-ray blob associated with this galaxy cluster called the Perseus cluster. And that, that tells us there's all this hot gas pervading the space between the galaxies. It means if you drop a small galaxy in there, it gets affected by what's called ram pressure stripping. So this is a dwarf galaxy that had some gas. And you can see it's kind of blue and distorted and probably falling into that, that dense gaseous uh, region, inter intercluster medium to the Perseus cluster and, and getting disrupted. And if you give it a few passes through the galaxy, a couple billion years, then it would fade and look something like this. After it's lost its gas, it stopped forming stars. The stars are what's, new stars are what's causing the, the blue color. It might look like a red and dead ultra diffuse galaxy. So I'm going to call this the vanilla recipe for making a UDG. And this is what all the theorists, generally one of the things they're, they're saying, yes, we know how to make UDGs. They're, they're formed by this kind of process. And I'm sure that happens. But it might not be the only thing that happens. OK, and lots of papers on this. Um, but is that the only way to cook up a UDG? Are there other recipes? And one of the clues is different groups, including our own, have been inventorying how many UDGs there are in different environments. And this is the mass of your dark matter halo from 10 to the trillion solar masses is the mass of the Milky Way. So that's a giant galaxy. But as you go up here, that's a group or a cluster, a really massive cluster. Or these are the most massive clusters in the universe. We've been working on these lately with the Hubble Space Telescope and count the number of UDGs. And it turns out to a first approximation, it's a linear relation between number of UDGs and the mass of your cluster or halo. So it tells you it's not a cluster specific prop, um, formation mechanism. The UDGs are forming everywhere. So there, there's more than one recipe. And these are some examples of things that are not even inside a, a galaxy group or orbiting a galaxy. They're kind of out in the field. So we are finding other UDGs that are kind of out on their own. So there's some way that they're born as UDG. So it's nature versus nurture. And we think that some nurture is happening. But there's also some that are UDGs by nature. So how are these formed? And I think one of the biggest clues is these globular clusters. So here we have this weird connection between the most extreme objects in the universe, the densest objects and the fluffiest objects. You can see here there's this fluffiest galaxy. And it's containing all these super dense objects. So why, what is this connection? That's something we're still trying, puzzling over. I think one of the possibilities is that those globular clusters, when they're formed, they're producing some kind of effect on the host galaxy that makes them fluffier, makes them diffuse. These are some examples of ultra-diffuse galaxies where you can hardly see any diffuse stars at all. You're basically just seeing the star clusters. So very strange. Um, up to a quarter of their mass is in globular clusters. And if you consider that globular clusters formed with other clusters that have since dissolved, it could be that they formed as 100% globular cluster populations. 
And these are what we call pure stellar halos. For people who know about the Milky Way, it's stellar halo. Um, and then they stopped, so they formed all their stars and clusters very early in the universe, in the first couple billion years, and then for some reason stopped. So I spent a lot of time in Santa Cruz, and so I came up with this recipe analogy, the, the half-baked galaxies, I call them failed galaxies. Okay, so this is a picture of how we might think that might look. This is redshift, this is basically time from the beginning of time to the end to today. And this is the stellar to halo mass ratio of how the, your galaxy builds up. So normally a galaxy will build up stars over time as gas cools and collapses and forms stars and gradually grow your galaxy. But the picture with the ultra diffuse galaxy is some way, somewhere way back in time it for some reason stopped growing stars, stopped uh, accreting gas and forming stars. And we're not sure, and that was around the epoch when the metal pore globular clusters formed. So we call this a failed galaxy. And I can make lots of predictions about this. I won't really get into all the details about what we think these are, are like, but one of the predictions would be we expect them to have overmassive dark matter halos, that galaxies will still be accumulating dark matter. They're just not accumulating stars and gas. So they, they should have a lot of dark matter. And that's where the fun begins of going out and trying to measure mass again. So um, now these are really faint objects. It means that it needs the world's most powerful telescopes. The Keck Observatory in Mauna Kea is um, the world's largest or most powerful optical telescope. I've, I've taken a bunch of undergrads out there over the last few years to go use it. Um, this was Enrique this year, going up on the mountain um, and uh, observing this. And, and our, our favorite new instrument to use is called the Keck Cosmic Web Imager. It's a we call it a 3D uh, spectrograph. It's two dimensions. It measures two dimensions of, of light on the sky. And for each pixel in the sky, it'll measure a spectrum. So you get a full spectral map of, of an object, especially a low surface brightness galaxy. Although um, one of our early runs, we had problems with clouds. So we tried to look at Saturn with Keck, the world's largest telescope looking at Saturn. And it turned out even through five magnitudes of extinction clouds, it's still saturated the detector. So we were trying to like take spectra of lightning on Saturn. And, it was still too bright. Anyway, um, so we're looking at these ultra diffuse galaxies, also looking at the ultra compact dwarfs to, and compact ellipticals to try to understand them. And there's an example of a spectrum uh, taken using Keck. Okay, so how about some results? This is a uh, this is sort of a schematic of the the light coming in from all the pixels uh, it's, you know, using an image slicer technology to to split up the light into this 2D array and. We get, but we don't, uh, a lot of times if you have a bright object, you'll get a full map, like I showed that red and blue velocity map of a galaxy at the beginning. In this case, we just use it as light bucket mode. There isn't enough signal to do that map. All you do is you take all the pixels in the galaxy and you sum them up in a, like a light bucket mode to get a single spectrum for that galaxy. And it looks something like this. And we have the spectral line here, which is a hydrogen line called H beta, which is a nice way to get the redshift to get the composition, also get what we call the velocity dispersion. Anybody remember what we get from the velocity dispersion? Why do we care about that? Why do we want to measure internal velocities of the galaxy? To measure mass, okay? So we're looking for mass. And here's another example. These are a couple of graduate students at Santa Cruz who have been working on these data um, with a spectrum. Now you start seeing some iron lines in the spectra, spectrum. Um, and I'll, I'll skip over this. This is more of the details about the, the iron lines being very weak in these things, which tells us they're probably primordial, um, and get to the fun stuff about the dark matter, okay, which has also been in the press quite a bit in two different ways. One was finding what's called the dark twin of the Milky Way, and the other was the opposite, the galaxy with no dark matter. Which one does everybody think was more controversial? The one... With a, oh yeah, good question, with a scientist. Um, the one without dark matter, yeah. I mean, originally the dark matter is puzzling, now that's part of the, our picture of the universe. So the missing matter, the missing matter is now missing here, and that's really puzzling. So it's, it's, it's not considered possible to form a galaxy without dark matter. And here we seem to have one, and we actually turn out to have two. So I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, but one of the things, the one that does have a lot of dark matter which is interesting both to this picture of a failed galaxy, but we can actually start looking at the structure of the dark matter halo and start trying to understand um, what kind of dark matter it is. So the labs are having trouble on Earth, the terrestrial labs, of 
telling what kind of dark matter particle it is, but it does make some different predictions of particles for what the structure is of the dark matter halo of the galaxy, including this thing called the fuzzy dark matter. And what this is, it's a, it, people who have done a little bit of uh, quantum or uh, modern physics, you might have seen the de Broglie wavelength. That's the idea that it's part of the uncertainty principle that you don't have any, any, anything with mass doesn't have a finite position. It has a certain wave associated with it. But normally, it's on subatomic scales with a macroscopic object. You wouldn't notice that. But if you have a really light object, the, the Bohr wavelength scales inversely with mass. You have a super light particle. So it has a larger and larger wavelength. And these are ultralight, 10 to the minus 22 eV. It turns out that that's the size of a galaxy. You have a particle that's so light that it has a, a wavelength the size of a galaxy, which then has interesting implications for um, this, the structure of the dark matter halo. And it, it also predicts a, a kind of like Bose-Einstein condensate at the center of the galaxy, making this, this bump or clump of dark matter particles all kind of oscillating together. So what we're going to do is look at the circular velocity and radius of this galaxy and look for this bump, we call a soliton bump, that could come from the fuzzy dark matter. Um, so that has been predicted over the past few years, and the theorists for a little while have been excited about this. So we were excited. We went to try to look for it. And, uh, and here's what the observations show. Remember earlier? I, I showed this picture of like a heat map of an ultra compact dwarf. Here I'm looking at a heat map of an ultra diffuse galaxy. And a uh, completely different type of observation, but it's the same idea. And in fact, we're looking for the same signature. We're looking for like a little red bump at the center. Instead of a supermassive black hole, it would be a dark matter soliton. And you can kind of see that's not there. It's actually cold in the center. So we, we didn't see it. It would have been fun. This would have been like. You know, I don't know if it's Nobel Prize winning or not, but it would be a big, a big result if we had found that. And we didn't find it. It doesn't completely rule it out. Um, there's some part of parameter space that's ruled out. Uh, I'll skip over all the details. But this, this is sort of a probability distribution of that dark matter particle mass in units of 10 to the minus 22 eV. So we sort of have this histogram of where it's permitted. And then you can have other different types of constraints from large scale structure will give you a different type of constraint. And it turns out it's in a bit of a tension from those other constraints. So kind of different lines of attack on the same problem produce independent pieces of evidence that seem to start conflicting. So in, in the terms of the, the whole story of this fuzzy dark matter, it starts to look unlikely. So that was a fun idea. It seems to be probably getting ruled out. Like basically all the dark matter stuff we've been doing so far, we've not been able to confirm any of the specific theories or particles yet. It's not completely dead yet, but it's looking unlikely. OK, so what about that one I mentioned with a low dark matter? This comes from making use of these globular clusters I mentioned, which are kind of a curiosity. So we went out to go measure the velocities of these things orbiting inside the galaxy, again, to measure mass and the idea of measuring all this dark matter. But it turns out that we measured no dark matter at all. So instead of uh, we've got velocities of those star clusters, instead of a really high velocity dispersion of, say, 50 kilometers per second, we got consistent with zero up to, say, nine kilometers per second, which is about the velocity you'd expect from the galaxy, just the starlight itself. If you go back to 1970, it's the sort of thing people would have expected of all galaxies, that you see the stars, you predict the amount of mass, and you're done. And then we started seeing it's totally different when you actually measure them. But this one goes back to 1970, how we thought it should work back then, with no dark matter. So it's, it's really puzzling. Also, like I said, very controversial. Um, and we've been doing lots of follow-up to try to just confirm this result. One of them was to go use this, this uh, cosmic web imager I mentioned to measure the stellar velocities, which confirms the same thing, measuring the width of the, um, the hydrogen line. Uh, and another group, an independent group in Europe, has done the same thing with a very large telescope and confirmed basically the same answer. And then we also found another object that has the same thing. So we've got two of these now. So it's not just one, it's two. So it becomes a population. And there's a third one, a secret one, which I can't tell you about, we're also working on, uh, we think is a good candidate. So there's a lot of controversy over this. Pro the, the observations don't seem to be going away. And we're kind of left with a question of how, how do you get this? And here's like a, a, a zoom out of where these galaxies are. This is a giant elliptical galaxy here in like a spiral, some other things nearby. These ultra diffuse galaxies are pretty far out from that big galaxy. One of the possibilities is that they're tidally stripped. Again, they used to have dark matter, um, kind of like you saw with the ultra-compact dwarfs, and that dark matter has been stripped away and leaving behind just the stars. Now, getting that to work out just exactly, like you take away the dark matter without destroying the whole galaxy is really hard. But maybe this, this particular case that just happened, just had all the stars lined up 
just the right way to, to get it to happen and got lucky. But um, we'll see. Um, so a lot of theorists have been working on some possible ways to explain this. And it turns out that the star clusters in these are also very unusual as well, which I won't get into. Again, these, these don't have normal globular clusters, they have ultra compact dwarfs. So that's another part of the puzzle. So let me leave you with a summary of everything I've talked about. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about Calbridge uh, for people who don't have to run away. So there's this picture of these ultra diffuse galaxies, the most diffuse, some of the most diffuse galaxies in the universe that tend to have, tend to have all sorts of interesting properties, globular clusters, uh, ultra compact dwarfs, large dark matter content, small dark matter content. Um, and they might be the channels for forming these ultra compact dwarfs, which I, which I mentioned. We're sort of puzzled about where some of them come from. Well, maybe this is one of the places they're born. Still don't know how, but that could be one of the places. Um, so let me just briefly, we can come back to question time on this. As four people run away, I wanted to mention the Calbridge program, which Alex mentioned. And I think the other Alex, are you, are you the other Alex as well? Yes. yes. So we have our first local Calbridge scholar from Sonoma State, Alex uh, Vesquez. <laughs> so um, Calbridge is a network of basically all the CSUs and all the UCs in the system. A couple are left out because of geography for now. And it started off in Southern California. Now in the last few years, it's, it started off in Northern California and we've been growing exponentially. We might have plateaued after this year. So here we go, Sonoma is one of the northernmost ones. And oh, what happened to Fresno? Okay, I lost my Fresno, but, oh, Fresno moved around. Okay, Fresno's actually down there. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and uh, this is a, it's a collaboration between CSUs and UCs. The idea is for, uh, for people who are um, interested in going into physics and astronomy, you like this kind of stuff I showed, or you like other types of physics, you know, how do you do that for the rest of your life? Or you don't have to commit to the rest of your life, but how do you start exploring that opportunity to do that? The answer is, um, where does it say? PhD is the word, it's not up there. Oh, there it is, PhD. You have to get a PhD to do this stuff professionally. And to do that, you have to finish well with your bachelor's, go on to a PhD program, and, and of course do well there. And it takes a lot of special preparations to do that, and the Calbridge is designed to do that because the UCs of the PhD grading institutions, they're working with us to help you get there. And part of that is that there's, it's mentoring, intensive mentoring and scholarships up to 10,000 a year so that people can study instead of working, you know, part-time or full-time or whatever. Uh, just focus on your studies, keep your grades up, really focus on doing research and studies. And um, we are now, as of this year, we're, we're supporting more than 50 students statewide. Uh, this was last year. Um, we've gotten much bigger since then of our entering class in Northern California, and people from San Jose, from Stanislaus, from San Francisco, from East Bay, and so, um, if you're interested in about it, um, talk to either Alex or come talk to me afterwards. Um, but the, there are some deadlines coming up to know about. The first thing is that Calbridge or not, if you're interested, potentially interested in, in this stuff, that, that, that what you want to do is try out research. And the big way to do that is during the summer when you're not having to study. So look out for the Campera program is one of the best ways to do that. So that deadline will be coming up in January. Think about applying for that. Calbridge itself is going to be almost a year off. That is in August, so it's a little early for that, but just keep it on your radar. Hopefully you'll be seeing announcements next year about that. So, and um, yeah, anyway, contact various of us for more information. So that's all I have for now, and I can take questions. <laughs>